Let me do a little housekeeping again. Read some of our mail for this week. <laughs> Always an adventure. Um, since Leanne's already alluded to this, I got email this week that says this, Jeff, what the heck? <laughs> I was there worshiping with everyone at 9 o'clock this past week. I decided to listen in and watch again from my home at 11.15. There are some things that I wanted to put in my notes that I didn't get at early church. <laughs> They went on. <laughs> it was an entirely different sermon. I know. Sure, points were the same, but it was a completely different experience. Does this happen every week? <laughs> Is this on purpose? <laughs> Is this some plan to get people to come to both services? Because I'm not going to fall for this trick, dude. <laughs> but heads up. If there's more content, that would be nice. Just let us know. All right. Um, that was, well, I was here. I'm not going to tell you who because you know who it is. Um, Somebody someone, that calls you dude. I know. <laughs> someone said, you should write another book, The St. Jeff Proverbs. I know you probably won't because you don't have the time. You're too busy doing something far more spiritual, covering University of Kentucky basketball. <laughs> Go Cats. Uh, we love the church at 434. We pray for you all each week here in Kentucky. Oh, wow. So, whoever they are. Uh, and I'm covering the cats right now, as a matter of fact, they're, they're playing. Um, this one says, another amazing day of worship for me and my family. We appreciate so much the work and effort the band puts in each week, the craftsmanship of your media team, and the way God uses you to speak for us here in Arkansas. Our Florida church is our lifeline. And then another piece of fan mail, Jeff, I knew you were not too tightly wrapped. <laughs> but I never thought that you would pull an alligator out of the baptistry. <laughs> Baptistry, by the way, is misspelled, um, <laughs> even if it wasn't real. It was hard to tell as I watched on the screen. Perhaps you should have told your video team you were going to do something foolish so they could have given you better lighting. <laughs> oh, see, oh. see, I thought this was going one way, and it goes another way the more you read it. You know, it's like you thought, ah, oh, they really appreciate it. Oh, they didn't appreciate this at all. And then it said, uh, and then, after making fun of baptism, you didn't baptize anyone. First and I'm like, first. they didn't watch till the very end. I mean, it, it, if they'd watched the last thing on in the worship service was baptism. So, again, more fan mail comes in. Keep it coming. Um, <laughs> tell your friends. Tell your family. They obviously don't know you well. If they thought that you didn't do anything for crazy. I, yeah, yeah, I, I'm just amazed what people mention to us. All right, tonight we continue our look at um, uncensored, an uncensored look at sin. Um, and we're going to talk about that and obedience and all that kind of good stuff. But we're going to play America's favorite game show, <laughs> Florida or Not Florida. And what I have here on the, uh, the, the white erase board is a headline. And then you, you as the participants, get to vote as to whether or not this is a Florida man or woman headline or whether it happened in another one of the 49 great states of America. <laughs> Entirely up to you. Um, first headline. This would be a Florida woman, if it's a Florida person. Uh, woman lets snake bite baby as a learning opportunity. For who? A woman, a woman <laughs> lets a snake bite as a learning opportunity. Ponder that for just a minute. Ponder your parenting skills. How many of you think that this is actually a Florida woman story? Show of hands. How many of you think it took, some pla took place someplace else? Well, <laughs> it is a Florida woman story. It took place in Sebring, Florida. Uh, the woman posted a video of it, actually. You can go find it. It is a red snake biting her one-year-old. No regrets for doing it. She wanted to introduce the child to snakes and what it means to live in Florida. And so she thought she was justified. Child services did show up at her house, by the way. Um, but a whole different thing. All right, that's the first one. Second one, man calls 911 to report himself for drunk driving. Man calls, man calls 911 to report himself for drunk driving. Now, ponder that, ponder the people you know. How many of you think that is a Florida man story? I know the guy. <laughs> and how many think it took place somewhere else? New York City. All right. It actually is a Florida man story. It comes out of Winter Haven. Uh, the man, 
Winter Haven. The man called to report himself drunk as he was driving around on New Year's Eve, and the dispatcher kept him on the line long enough for the police to find him, catch up with him, and then, of course, arrest him uh, on the spot. Um, down here, uh, a woman seeks the court, a woman seeks court approval to change her daughter's name to Awesome. A woman goes to court to legally have her daughter's name changed to Awesome. How many think that sounds like a Florida woman story? And so how many think it would have been someone else? It is an Alaska woman story. Um, and I have no, no idea why, and I have nothing else to add behind that. I don't know. I can't, I, I, can't, I can't give you anything else. But we have more headlines. All right, number next. Here's one for you. Hi, guys. This is the headline. Woman says lingerie firm fired her because she is just too hot. <laughs> now dwell on that for just a minute. All right. That's the headline. Woman says lingerie firm fired her because she's just too hot. How many think that's a Florida woman no. story right there? No. No. Oh, you say no. Why are you so, why are you so adamant about that? Are Florida women not too hot? <laughs> <laughs> All right. How many? How many? How many? How many think it was uh, some someplace else? All right. It actually is not Florida at all. It is it is uh, officially New Jersey woman that would have done this. Um, her name is Lauren O'Days, and she was fired um, from the office um, because they said you are just too hot for this office. She was offended by that. She filed suit. She sued for gender and religious. Discrimination, and I don't know how religion got into it, because I have I find very few biblical proof texts for lingerie. But neither here nor there. I'm sure that if you want to build a case, you can. She won, um, and so there we go. But that's uh, a New Jersey woman did that. All right. Uh, I actually have a picture of this one. Uh, woman reports finding sign from God on a goldfish cracker. Now, she says, and we'll pass this around. That there was actually a cross and a crown. On this goldfish. You can pass around, share that with your friends. Um, and she considers it a sign from God. So, how many of you, without seeing the picture, think that that is a Florida woman story? And how many think some, that had to come from somewhere else? It is a Florida woman story. She said that this goldfish was a testimony of her faith and that God had revealed himself to her through a goldfish. <laughs> Go figure. Um, all right. There it is. This is all like a Florida woman issue. Florida woman issue. I, you know, I've tapped out of Florida man stuff. There's no more stuff out there. All right. Woman scams four people out of $100,000 in a toilet fan scheme. A woman scams four people out of $100,000 in a toilet fan scheme. How many of you think that would be a Florida endeavor? Let's see your hands. How many think somewhere else, some other state, somewhere else far away? All right. It is Florida woman once again. This is out of Deerfield Beach. Uh, the woman convinced people to invest in what was called a pan fan. Now, this is a real device that's installed on the back of the toilet seat, and it sucks air inside, purifies it before it lets it back out into the bathroom. Huh. No, thank you. <laughs> Four people invested $100,000 in this, only to find out that although it is a real thing, she used the money for clothes, spa treatments, and dinners and travel. And so she was arrested for scamming people in her toilet fan scheme. That is a Florida woman at her best. All right, and then this one. Um, woman claims to be God and flees on a tricycle. Why does God need a tricycle? <laughs> woman claims to be God and flees on a tricycle. Is that a Florida woman story or is that somewhere else? Florida woman? Yeah. Somewhere else. It's Florida woman. <laughs> Naples. 
Naples, Florida, a woman claiming to be God held up a postal truck, <laughs> stole an Amazon package, and then fled the scene on a tricycle. She chased down a jogger who was passing her on, while she was on the tricycle and pointed a replica pistol at that jogger and then proceeded to run her tricycle into another mail truck and stole that truck before she was arrested. Um, and her defense was they couldn't arrest her. She was God. <laughs> Gotta love it, right? I mean, it, it is, it is only, uh, only as Florida man and woman could do. Um, those are the stories. Now, we said last week that uh, to be a Florida man, Florida woman, there's some things that have to take place. Obviously, you have to be in Florida. Um, and this week, we're going to tell you why we know a lot about Florida man and Florida woman. But there also, there's some other things involved. Usually, there is some type of chemical imbalance taking place, fueled by alcohol or drugs, more often than not. Um, there also is, uh, so usually, there's, and to expand it more than we did last week, there's usually an extenuating circumstance, some sort, some sort of pressure that causes a person to break. I, I, I also said there's a kiss of crazy. Um, somebody said that I, they were offended by my use of the word crazy. I said, you're crazy. And um, they, uh, but I mean, there's just something, there's, there's a moment of insanity where we, 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 we let loose, where sin kind of kicks in and gets the best of us. Bad behavior gets the best of us. And so last week we talked about how um, there are some good things that come about because of sin. And so if you were with us last week, we looked at these, and we, we talked about the fact that we, all of us have sinned. We understand that. Some of us are pretty good at it, by the way. And so I wanted to give you a good word or two about sin. And so we said, our conclusion was, if it weren't for our sin, we never would have known God. It took our sin to get us to know God. That makes sense. We also said, if it wasn't for our sin, we wouldn't love each other. And I think last week we wrapped up as we were talking about the fact that if it wasn't for our sin, we never would have discovered joy. Because there never would have been that element in our life that would have led us to the point where we were um, appreciative and understood what it meant to be forgiven for sin, to find that joy that happens uh, and that completeness and wholeness that happens when we're forgiven. And so that's kind of where we wrapped up last week. Is that what you all had? Yep. Okay, we're good. <laughs> all right, all right. Okay. So that being said, um, let's... I, I want to make sure before we go too far, though, um, that I am thankful for my sin from the standpoint of what we talked about last week. But I also want to, on the record officially, that I also hate my sin. Okay? I mean, I, I don't want you to think that I'm advocating, no, let's go sin. I, I, I think sin gives us some good things, and I think that we are some things that we, we, we are better for because of our sin. It gets us to God. But I also hate um, my sin. And I think that most of you would probably say the same thing. Um, in the Bible, we, we read about it, we, we learn how to deal with people, and I've grown up in church, and I think I mentioned this a little bit last week, and I always used to hear in church, and I think I've said it a number of times, you, know, that you have to love the sinner and hate the sin. You ever heard that? Love the sinner, hate the sin. I want you to hear me very carefully, lose that from your vocabulary. Love sinner, hate sin, lose that from your vocabulary. And here's why. Because I went looking this week to see if I could learn something new. That's not biblical. My Bible says that we love the sinner and hate our own sin. See, I got enough problem with my own sin to worry about yours. And if I can keep my focus on your sin, then guess what I don't have to focus on, on anymore is my sin. Yeah, it works great, right? Uh, and so, so when we say that phrase, you know, love the sinner, hate the sin. No, no. Love the sinner, hate your own sin. Let them deal with their stuff. Because our job, if I go back and look, the biblical command is that we just, we love God. We love others. Right? He doesn't add the back in parentheses and hate their sin. That's not there. And so I know the intent in which we say it, I got it, uh, but since this is a look at sin uncensored, uh, I, you know, I, I, I think that most of us have enough issues with our own sin to really be spending time worrying about and critiquing other people's sin. Just love them. Love them, hate your own mistakes. Let them make their own. 
I promise you, any time that you make a mistake, you take lumps for it. God has an amazing way of kind of balancing the books. Um, and if you're trying to follow Him, you know, you know when you're doing it right, you know when you're doing it wrong, uh, and we have to get it right. And I, um, so I mean, again, just lose that from your vocabulary. Uh, I gave you some pros about sin last week, and so again, I have to come back and clean up that mess a little bit, because if this is really an uncensored look, um, we have to admit, and I'll admit this to you, I'm not a really good person. Now, if you hang around me long enough, you figure that out. Uh, and if you don't hang around me, I can fool you. Um, but you probably don't know, know many people that want to please God more than I want to please Him. Okay, I'm not good, but I really do want to get it right. And so I spend a great deal of energy wrestling back and forth with who God has called me to be and what I'm trying to do and how I'm going to get it right. And so it brings us to a question we kind of want to play with tonight a little bit. If obedience is so hard, how do we get there? Because you know, we're good at sin, and sin has done some really good things for us. But for Florida man and Florida woman, I mean, obviously there's a point in life where they decide that this is a good idea. And, we, we, and we're laughing at their mistakes because they're so outlandish. Most of us don't make mistakes that make the headlines. Most of our mistakes are a little less subtle than, than others. I mean, we, we're, we're okay with that. Um, but there's a powerful truth um, that we have to deal with is the fact that Jesus wants us to be better. He died so we could be better. Not a better sinner, <laughs> but a better person. And he died so that we could change. And so, um, we're going to go to Luke chapter 7 tonight. And, um, and we're going to dig into that just a little bit. It's one of those fascinating passages to me. Uh, I think it is one of the most moving in all of Scripture. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and I would say to you that one of the things that we also have to remember, and we talk about this a lot, is that one of the most powerful weapons we have against sin and disobedience is truth. Truth. And truth is radically important. It is wildly important. It, it is so essential for us uh, to get right what we're doing. Uh, I know that some of you guys have been uh, talking and, and you have been uh, in our Sunrise Bible Study courses, which have been great, we've been having, we had two courses on prayer that we just finished up. We move into a new month. Um, Ian is teaching one of the courses, and Ian is going to take, take us to what is kind of prayer at the next level. He's actually going to use a word that we don't use a lot when it comes to prayer. Uh, he's going to talk about un unlocking um, the secrets and the power of meditation. Now, meditation, you know, we hear that, oh, they're like, oh, meditate, we don't put people on to meditate. No, meditation is a biblical word. And one of the things that he's going to point out is how often it's used in the Bible. What's frightening is how Christians don't understand what meditation is about. So for some of you, if you've enjoyed the prayer studies, and we've had two, you want to take it to a different level, this is where you need to park it. If you don't want to park it there, your other choice is a little bit more gruesome. It's called last blood. It's built on the idea that the blood of Christ is all we needed. That sacrifice changes everything. And that means as we deal with the culture that we live in and what our culture looks like, we come to a moment where we have what we need, but we have to understand the world as it is. And we have to understand what kind of follower we have to be to make a difference. And sadly, you know, for a lot of church people, it's not cutting it. we got to get better at it. And so you got two extremes you can go to, because obedience is necessary. You have to connect with God. You have to have that intimacy with God. And then you have to put it in motion. You have to follow. And so both of the courses will take you down one of those two roads. One will be about intimacy with God. One will be about, okay, let's be a warrior. And I'm going to go back to a story I told a long time ago about learning to fight for the heart of your king. We're going to go back in history and we're going to look at some stuff. And I'm going to tell you a couple passages you've never been to before. I promise you, you've never been to them before. Um, and we're going to see what that looks like. Because we have to be better at this thing called obedience. Because if we're not, then we run that risk of falling into the trap of being ineffective, uh, making the Florida man, Florida woman mistakes, being headlines in, in next week's, you know, um, whatever magazine you want to come out with. Um, and we don't want to do that. And so for us... If we're going to build on truth and we're going to get to know Jesus better, 
then what we have to do is we have to just admit that we, if we're going to be better, we have to get close to Jesus. And after you get close to Him, then our job is to tell everybody that we got close to Jesus. That's why we're better. I mean, it's not overly complicated. And intimacy with God simply means that you, you have connected with Him. You're spending time with Him. You're, you're in a dialogue with Him. You're, you're, uh, you're, you're relating to Him in a very close, personal way. He ought to be the closest relationship you have. And so we're going to go to Luke chapter 7, um, where Jesus is actually anointed by a woman, and we're going to read that. Uh, let's go ahead and read that. Luke chapter 7, uh, verses 36 through 50. Luke 7, 36 through 50. It's a lot of verses, but someone who's brave could read it out loud for us. <laughs> Remember, we're recording. Mm -hmm. Now one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, so he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. When a woman who had lived in a sinful life in that town learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster jar of perfume, and as she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two men owed a money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he canceled the debts of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt canceled. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, for she has loved much, but he who has been forgiven little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, Your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Just before we jump into the, the passage, if you have your Bibles open, keep it open or your app open. Um, this is not the only time that Jesus is anointed in similar fashion in Scripture. Matter of fact, all four Gospels tell a story about Jesus being anointed. Um, so it begs the question, is it the same event recorded in all the Gospels? And the answer is no, it's not. It's not the same event. And sometimes the assumption has been made that this is Mary Magdalene. Now you know Mary Magdalene, she's the one that wears the blue all the time in The Chosen. <laughs> um, um, this, is not, this is not her. This is not Mary Magdalene. Although you will pick up, if you want to pick up a commentary somewhere and you start reading it, they're going to say it's Mary Magdalene. They're going to call this woman Mary Magdalene. And I want you to hear me very carefully. They're wrong. They're wrong and they're doing bad biblical exegetical work. You cannot make that conclusion that this is Mary Magdalene. There's no way that dog don't hunt, that shark don't swim, that fish don't fly or fry. <laughs> and it doesn't work. It, it doesn't make sense. It's not true. Um, you, later on, you're going to find that there's a woman named Mary who anoints Jesus' feet, and that is actually Mary of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Okay? But this woman is not Mary Magdalene. And so if you ever heard that in church, you heard wrong, I'm sorry. And it's not because your pastor was trying to fool you. It's just because that's what a lot of the commentators said for a lot of years until someone got smart enough to really look at the Bible. And it doesn't wash that way. You can't track it that way. It's not who it is. That is important in the story. It's important to know who's doing what. It's important to understand God's Word because that's where the richness begins to come out of it. Um, and so when you do a deep dive in the Scripture, then we get to Luke chapter 7, these verses. And I want you to understand, this is one of the most radical passages of Scripture in all the Bible. I mean, it's about a dinner party, you know that, summary of it, you've just heard. Um, it took place at the house of Simon, who's a Pharisee, uh, very religious, very good. 
Um, I suppose most of the people that would have come to a dinner at Simon's house would have been religious and good. Uh, by nature, Pharisees don't usually hang out with people who aren't religious and good. And so from that standpoint, I would tend to think that Simon um, probably invited those that were closest to him. Um, and the dinner party was interrupted, as we read the passage, by a commotion. Um, a prostitute. Uh, Leanne's version was nice. The word actually translates, it's a prostitute. A prostitute shows up and crashes the party because she came to see Jesus. Jesus treated her with kindness. He didn't condemn her, but he rather forgave her and held her up as an example of love. Now, I want you to know the things that are closest to the heart of Jesus are always going to be offensive to Pharisees. The things that are closest to the heart of Jesus will always be offensive to Pharisees. Some of you will remember a while back I told a story um, in the Genius series where I talked about an encounter I had with a church person that got very offended because they took something I said in the sermon to heart. And I said something to them and they prompted a poke to my chest, which, you know, doesn't usually happen in church. Um, someone, one person, took the time to seek me out and said, what did you say to them that caused the poke to the chest? I said to them what I just said. As they were ranting and raving about how I had offended them, I said to them, you know, it's amazing. The things that are closest to the heart of Jesus will always offend a Pharisee. And it prompted a physical, violent reaction from them where they decided they wanted, they wanted to poke me in the chest and knock me backwards. Um, that's what I said. So that's the answer to the trivia question. If you ever, anyone ever asked about that story, after I'm dead and gone, you retell the story someday, you know, that's exactly what I said to them. Um, it made them mad. Eh, so what? It's true. And again, I didn't call him a Pharisee, by the way. I certainly implied it, <laughs> no doubt. But he was already convinced I had called him a pig. And I had called him a few other things that I didn't realize I had called him in the sermon. Um, but this is, this is one of those stories that um, when you're a person who really wants to get better, and we know how hard it is. We know how tough obedience is. This story is pretty instructive. And, and I think that sometimes as we move into the Scripture, we've never looked at it as an instructive story for us. Um, it's an incredibly moving passage. Um, I, I've walked with Jesus for, for a few years now. Um, sometimes good, sometimes not so good. I, sometimes I follow really well, sometimes I don't follow well. Um, and this story, and some of you know enough about me to know this story resonates with me a lot. Um, and again, not to relive the story, but I, I have been in a church environment where um, during an invitation, at the church I was in at the time, gave invitations. And I was a young student guy with hair yeah, a little bit shorter than it is now, um, wearing my suit and tie, meeting the dress code. Standing up there during an invitation, incredibly bored. Because, you know, when you give an invitation, you're really preaching to the choir, um, for the most part, you know, and you're waiting for somebody to make a decision. When this woman comes from the back and makes her way down the aisle, I didn't know who she was, and I thought, well, surely she'll walk down and go talk to the pastor who's standing in the center. Because, you know, it was a church where the pastor was standing right in front of the pulpit, and then I was the minister of students, so I was on the right-hand side. And then our ministry education was on the left-hand side. Uh, I was on the right-hand side because I was like John, young. <laughs> I would have to go over and put my head on my pastor's breast, as, as, they, as John did in Scripture, you know, at the end of worship every day. Uh, anyway, so I'm sitting there, I'm bored, bored out of my head. I'm like, how many verses of this song are we going to have to do? And, you know, how, i got to stand up here again, you know. And, you stand and you wait, you know, and you stand and you wait. And they teach you how to stand in seminary you know, during, a, for, you know, for, during an invitation. You stand, you put your hands behind your back, uh, shoulder, uh, feet spread out about shoulder width, you know, stand so you, you know, stay on balance. But that way also you're nimble and quick. You can move as the masses come down the aisle, you know. So they teach all that. So I'm trying to remember all the things I've learned because nobody's coming down the aisle. And this woman comes down the aisle 
And she doesn't go to the pastor. She comes to the youth guy. And I notice when she comes forward, and I don't know why I notice this, because, you know, again, I'm in church, so I'm certainly not noticing. She's not dressed like other church people. Um, wasn't really dressed for church at all. Really, really dressed for what I would say. Um, well, she probably could have been working for um, the lingerie firm. <laughs> to be honest with you. Um, and that's what she came forward in. But, you know, I, 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 I did my job. You know, I'm like, why, why have you come forward? <laughs> <laughs> and we have this conversation, you know, and, 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 and we pray and, and she comes to uh, accept Christ and, we, we, uh, and she wants to join the church. And so um, I prayed with her and then we have counselors. We had counselors that we'd farm people off to, you know. And so, you know, I'm watching the counselors scramble as I look up, because I'm looking for a counselor, and I'm like, who am I going to pair this woman with? <laughs> and, and, you know, so that's, that's a moment of angst. And, but I thought I pulled it off pretty well, and, and she goes, uh, she goes uh, you know, in and goes in the counseling thing, and um, I saw her after church for just a minute, and it was an exciting time. You know, she, she had given her life to Christ. She was going to join the church. I got a call afternoon. I needed to come to the deacon's meeting that night. Uh, got there and sat down at a deacon's meeting, and there was a scandal, a problem at the church. And again, I'm just a youth guy. I know nothing about any of this nonsense. It's church. It's dumb. And um, apparently, that morning, uh, and I finally dialed into the conversation. You, you, again, I, I don't like meetings for the most part either. And most of you that have been around me know that, uh, you know, if we call a meeting, we try to get something done. And, and if there's a re- way I can ever get out of a meeting, I get out of the meeting. I don't go. I just don't go. I skip it, you know. And I feel guilty about it. You know, Glenn Rogers makes me feel guilty because he's so good <laughs> and godly. And he has meetings, and I just always miss them. <laughs> I love Glenn. I love Glenn. He's my pastor. I love Glenn. God, I, hate, I just hate meetings. So I just don't go. And, um, and, and so I started paying attention all of a sudden this meeting because we had, I found out, someone who tried to join the church. They were going to let join the church. And I'm now all of a sudden, I'm very intrigued what's going on. I have no idea what's happened. Come to find out, this woman who had come forward was a prostitute, a known prostitute in the city of Lake Worth, Florida. And um, she had prayed with me, and of course, all of a sudden, my name gets mentioned to me, and now I really care. <laughs> oh, Lord, don't mind me, don't mind me. And, um, and I'm listening to this, and basically the gist of it was <laughs> that they were not going to let her join the church because she was a known prostitute. So this is the moment that, again, there's a lot of moments in ministry that you come to the crossroads, <laughs> and it becomes pivotal. And you sit there, and you decide, am I going to say something, or do you let it slide? Am I going to say what's on my heart, or am I just going to be dumb? And so this was one of those pivotal moments for me in ministry. It changed the trajectory of my ministry forever. I raised my hand, <laughs> and so the chairman of the deacons looked at me and said, yes. <laughs> I, said, I said, I got a question. How do you guys in this room know that she's a known prostitute? <laughs> <laughs> and the room went, they didn't laugh. Well, I did. They, they, they did that. That's not what I heard. <laughs> it wasn't the sound of heavenly laughter. It was the sound of, <clears throat> like somebody had been gut punched. And all the air went out of the room. And now I had every eye in the room. <laughs> on the lowly youth guy, who's not making that much money, you know, and, and basically got out of seminary still smoking at the backside because I was just trying to stay out of hell. And, um, and so nobody said anything. And so at that moment, you know, and there's some moments where God, sh- I think, shows up and, and does things with you that you never could have done on your own. And I, and I tend to think what happened in the next few minutes was that, because I repeated the question. I figured if I silenced the room the first time, maybe I would get an answer the second time. How do you guys know she's a known prostitute? And so I called a couple of them by name. I said, do you know? Do you know? I said, because I didn't know her when she came down. Oh, sure, she wasn't dressed like church people, but... Isn't that who we reach? And so it began a conversation where basically there was an impasse. 
we were not going to let this woman join the church. She was not going to join the church. But I had the floor. And I said, if you don't let her join the church, then you aren't godly enough to be leaders of this church. And I don't think I can stay this church very long. Now, what I didn't know when I said that is that I really was prophesying my own demise at that <laughs> church, <laughs> which was okay. But for 15 minutes, I did have the floor. And I waxed eloquently about the forgiveness of God and the grace of God. And if a prostitute couldn't join the church, then I couldn't join the church. And it may be the ones that needed to be saved were the deacons in the room. That went over well, too, as you might imagine. <laughs> the only person that agreed with me, the only person that agreed with me, now two, the minister of education agreed with me, and he was a very good friend. And, um, and he basically grabbed me by the shoulder and said, you need to get out of this room now. <laughs> and he walked me out in the hallway and he said, you have said your piece. And he said, you're not going to have a job next week. And he goes, I don't know if I'll have one either. I mean, because he was upset. Then the chairman of the deacons came out. And he said, you were the only one that had the guts to say that. And he goes, I wish I would have. The next week, he resigned as chairman of the deacons. Um, and Ken LaValle, to this day, is a very good friend of mine. Um, probably the best teacher I've ever heard in my life, outside of Ken Smith. And... Um, and I know I was right. I was right. Not because I was smart, but because if a prostitute can't join, then who can? And so when I say that this story really does mean a lot to me because of the setting of the story and what transpires, I think in that moment um, I have lived part of this story. I was never the same after that ministry. Never have been. Never will be. I love to fight for the underdog. Eh, that's beyond. I love to fight. <laughs> if there's a fight, I'm up for it. Especially if I can get on. If, I, if, if it's a righteous fight, I'm all over it. If it's a stupid fight, you know, go paint the wall any color you want. I'm not going to fight. I'm not going to fight with carpet, carpet color in the church. I don't care. Jesus didn't die for carpet colors. He didn't climb the furniture. I, I, don't, I, you know, I don't care about any of that. But if it's a righteous fight, I'm on it. I'm good for that. Um, and this, that probably was one of those playgrounds where I learned it to, do, to do that. And so this passage, when you look at it closely, um, there's a lot that's revealed here about the prostitute going to Jesus, how Jesus responds, and then what it means to us. Okay? The first thing I want you to see, and we'll do this when we'll run out of time, we'll pick it up next week. The prostitute in the story knew she was a sinner, and she ran to Jesus. The prostitute in the story knew she was a sinner, and she got to Jesus. Sadly, um, I know people, you know people, when we sin and we make mistakes, the last place we want to go is to Jesus. We run from him. I always tell people when they're in the midst of crisis, don't run from him, run to him. Yet our nature is to run from God. And I know people have run from God a long, long time before they ever turned around and ran back toward him. But this is a powerful reminder that when you have blown it, when you are a sinner, when you are a screw-up, as big as you can be, the place you want to go is to Jesus, not away from him. She gets to Jesus. See, Luke says, a woman who had lived a sinful life, or a prostitute, brought an alabaster flask of ointment, standing behind him at his feet, weeping. She began to wet his feet with her tears, wipe them with the hair of her head, kiss his feet, and anoint them with the ointment. The woman risked embarrassment, ridicule, and condemnation because she saw something about Jesus that most of us forget. Jesus always welcomed sinners. And for me, that's what I saw in South Florida on a Sunday at a church. It started like any other Sunday. I never knew how it was going to blow up my life. See, a lot of people have a terrible impression of God. Um, 
sometimes parents use God to scare their children into obedience. <laughs> uh, I, you know, they say something, you know, I, I, I may not see what you do, but God does. God sees you. Jesus sees us. And, uh, and if Jesus sees us, he'll get you. Um, we use his anger, we use his anger at and the hatred of sin to gain power and manipulate others. You know, if I can find out what your sin is, I can beat you with that, right? Find out what mine is, you can beat me with that too. Um, and we talk about God being a consuming fire. We did a whole series on that, but we also have to tell the rest of the story. But sometimes, I got news for you. I mean, sometimes we're self-righteous. We talk about people going to hell and we act like we're glad. That's wrong. That's not, that's not the Jesus of Scripture. That's not the God that we're called to follow. And so, in the Word it says, in John 1, 14, the Word, which was God, became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. If you ever forget that, Trying to be obedient will kill you. Because he came full of grace and truth. And at the risk of getting into a very fine line where I would need to explain it more and I don't have time to, even if you never get any better than you are right now, God will not love you any less than he does right now. I mean, if you never get any better than you are right now at following God, God's never going to love you less. Which is fantastic news. And if you get a lot better, if you get a lot better, you get really good at following God, you know what? He's not going to love you anymore. In other words, His love for you is unconditional and it's a constant. And it's never been about you earning it or working for it. It's just been about you accepting it. And if you don't understand that, You'll never be obedient. If you don't understand that, you'll never get better at what you're doing. See, because you're always working to get better. Why? So God will love you more. Can't do it. Not going to happen. If I have to just try harder, God will, God will bless that more. No, no, no. I think, I think the love blessing thing, He's got. He'll bless obedience, no doubt about it. But He's, he, you have to do anything. God's crazy about you. He's crazy about you when you're rotten. rotten. He's crazy about you when you're as good as you can be. That's who God is. And the prostitute didn't go to Jesus to get better. There's nothing in Scripture to indicate that. She went to Jesus to be loved by the one person who would love her unconditionally without wanting anything from her in return. She had heard enough. She knew enough. She had seen enough about Jesus. She just had to get to him. Which brings me to the second thing about the prostitute, or what we see in the story. The prostitute not only knew she was a sinner and ran to Jesus, but she didn't care who noticed. And you know what's wrong with Christian people? We care too much. See, we don't want people to know we're not perfect. We don't know. Or we don't want people to know that we're flawed. You know, I've told you many times, you know, Paul says in the Scripture, he's the chief among sinners, but he's dead. I've taken his place. I'm chief among sinners. Some of you are nipping at my heels. You're running a close second. And one day when I'm gone, you can take over and be chief among sinners. I, I'm just being honest about the reality of our lives. I'm broken, and so are you. And we sin. But we act like we don't. And if we're not careful, we forget that one of the interesting things about this incident is that Jesus does something, and we're out, we're out of time, um, does something that, that you're taught never to do. And we're going to leave it at this and pick up on it because if Jesus did it, then it must have been right, even though we would never do this. Because Jesus, it seems like, and I say, it seems like, we're going to leave it hanging at that. So remember, I say, it seems like he tries to embarrass her. Because this prostitute is there, she's crying, she's weeping, she's in this room of holy people. She's gone to a deacon's meeting. 
And Jesus does the most unthinkable thing. He calls the host out by name. and says, Simon, do you see this woman? He calls her out. It's horrible form. Look at John Barber. You see him? What a wretched sinner he is. Preach. I mean, I mean, that's just horrible form, right? You don't do that. You don't embarrass somebody that bad. You better know him really well if you're going to embarrass him that bad. Um, you just don't do that. You don't call somebody out like that. And it's almost like Jesus calls her out. You see this woman? Well, if they didn't see her before, they're going to see her now, aren't they, Jesus? And I think they already knew she was there. Well, they knew she was there, but nobody wanted to look at her. Yeah. And he was going to make real sure. And it begs the question, how many of those guys knew she was a known prostitute? That's what I say. When you bow your heads and heart, let's pray. Let's get out of here. God, you are good. And we are not, but we want to be better. There's a whole lot wrapped up in that. But to be better, we have to be willing to be serious about what you've called us to be. And so God, tonight I pray that you would watch over us as we leave this place. Help us to have a real uncensored view of sin and the reality of it in our own lives. What it's accomplished. How it's brought us to you. But more importantly, how you have changed us and hopefully you've changed the way we deal with others. We're loved. And we're loved no matter what. If we could love just a little bit like that, we would change the world in powerful ways. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. See you guys.